Thanks. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Ben Cooper, who can't be with us today, but is hopefully online and able to take some of the more complicated modeling questions um, at the end. Um, so firstly, hepatitis E virus um, is thought to be responsible for about 20 million infections worldwide every year, about 3 million symptomatic cases and about 70,000 deaths. Um, approximately 20% of those infected are thought to develop clinical symptoms, and we see case fatality rate in non-pregnant cases of about 2%, but this increases tenfold in pregnant cases. And um, MSF has been involved in uh, uh, quite a few um, outbreaks recently, um, most recently in Darfur, Uganda, South Sudan, and as you've just seen, in Chad. Um, transmission is fecal oral, and although hepatitis C virus has been isolated from surface water bodies in um, Darfur and in South Sudan, um, there's an increasing um, body of evidence that's pointing to person-to-person -person transmission within households being the most likely um, form of transmission um, to explain the dynamics that we see. In terms of control, as you've just heard, the uh, impact of water and sanitation responses is uncertain. And in terms of treatment, we have fairly limited options, really only supportive care. But there is a hepatitis E vaccine, and it's been shown to be safe and effective. Um, it's called HEV239 or Hecalin. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, but it's only licensed in China for use in 16 to 65 year olds that are not pregnant. And its infection, effectiveness sorry, um, was deduced in a large scale randomized control trial that was uh, published in The Lancet in 2010. And that was in an endemic setting in China, but its potential impact in an outbreak setting is uncertain. So we decided to explore that through mathematical modeling. Firstly, by estimating key epidemiological parameters that are involved in transmission. So things like the basic reproduction number, um, which indicates how many uh, secondary cases would result from a single infected case. And then using these parameters to build um, or to construct a, a model um, and evaluating the effect of the vaccine in a, an outbreak situation. And then evaluating further the uh, benefit of extending the vaccine to um, pregnant women and younger and older age groups, uh, which are not currently, um, which the vaccine is not currently licensed for. So as we said earlier, uh, MSF responded to a large outbreak in Uganda between 2007 and 2009. It was in refugee camps in the Kitgum district and resulted in about 10,000 cases and 113 deaths. About 50% of those cases were in just three camps, Agoro, Madio Pei, where the outbreak started, and Palaga. So we fitted a deterministic compartmental transmission dynamic model <laughs> to these three outbreaks. And that basically just means that we can divide the population into compartments um, and depending on their infection status. And these people can move between compartments depending on the transmission dynamics. And I'll explain that a little bit better in the next slide. Um, uh, for model one, you can see here that it's um, that we have an SEIR model. Um, so individuals can be distributed within any of these four compartments. S is for susceptible, that means they're not immune and not yet infected. E is for exposed, they're latently infected uh, but not yet infectious. I is for infected and infectious. And R is for recovered and immune. And the solid line or solid arrows show the movement, uh, potential movement of individuals between compartments. And the dotted line shows influence um, uh, from one compartment to the other. So the infectious people can influence the rate at which susceptible people move to the infected state. I'm going to um, present the results of model one. But as you can see, we explored a whole range of models, um, six models, in fact, um, that represent the uncertainty that we have around transmission dynamics. Um, but the results were broadly similar. So this is where we fitted um, the, the model to the three outbreaks in Agoro, Madiope, and Palaga. 
The circles indicate the real data, the observed cases, that's the number of cases per week that we saw in each of these outbreaks. And the gray shaded area represents the uncertainty around that. And the solid colored lines indicate the model fits and the colored shading, the uncertainty around that. So you can see that the models fitted pretty well to the three outbreaks. I'm going to skip over this um, slide a little bit in the interest of time. Um, this shows how we uh, used the models to um, um, ascertain the model parameters um, a little bit better. But I just want to bring your attention to this lower row of figures where we um, estimated the basic reproduction number, or R0, for each of the outbreaks. And you can see that there, there is some variability between the three outbreaks, but that the values are relatively high. Not as high as, say, measles, which is around 15 and highly infectious, but higher than Ebola, which is around 2, and kind of equivalent to polio, which is around 8 or 9. So using the Bayesian analysis, we um, um, created vaccine effectiveness distributions from the, an analysis of that data from the large randomized control trial that was published in The Lancet. We assumed 80% coverage and uh, dose intervals of one month between the first and second dose and five months between the second and the third dose. There was no evidence in that original trial for any effect from a single dose, so that was excluded from the analysis. So we plugged this um, effectiveness distribution into the model, and this is what we see. So this figure um, shows the percentage reduction in the number of cases, which is given in gray, the number of total deaths in orange, and the number of deaths of pregnant women given in blue. This is um, a pre, sorry, a reactive um, vaccination response, two doses after the first 100 cases. And you can see that we can see, um, we can expect quite reasonable um, reductions in both cases and deaths, up to about um, 30% um, using this kind of approach. This is the same scenario, but just reacting a little bit earlier after the first 50 cases, rather than the first 100 cases. And you can see, we can see uh, you, that we will see a much larger effect, up to about 45% reduction in cases and deaths if we react a little bit earlier. Um, but something to um, bear in mind is that the vaccine is only uh, licensed for use in 16 to 65 year olds that are not pregnant. So the effectiveness in all of these other groups is assuming that it's the vaccine is safe and effective in, in those groups. Um, but you can see that if we don't vaccinate pregnant women, that actually um, we will see very, very little effect in reducing uh, deaths in pregnant women. And that's because we're not achieving, we're not acting fast enough and achieving herd immunity when it's needed, which is basically before an outbreak starts. So we decided to explore that, and this is preemptive vaccination before an outbreak starts. And you can see this is for two doses before the first case that we are already seeing much, much larger um, um, effect effects than um, in a reactive vaccination response. Um, and this is, again, assuming that the vaccine can be shown to be um, safe and effective in uh, pregnant women and older and younger age groups. Um, and something to note here is that we're even seeing a larger effect even if we don't vaccinate pregnant women. If we vaccinate everyone else but except pregnant women, we will still see a large effect. And that's because we're starting to see an indirect effect of the vaccination approach. Um, and if we look here, this is the group, the 16 to 65-year-olds that are not pregnant. Um, if we simply add the pregnant women, although we don't see a very large difference in the number of cases, we see quite substantial um, um, benefits from, in terms of total deaths and in terms of total deaths in pregnant women. And then if we manage to... Um, vaccinate using three doses before the first case, so in a preemptive approach, 
and vaccinate everyone, we can see um, almost 100% of cases being prevented and herd immunity being reached. So the conclusions, uh, reactive vaccination can lead to important reductions in mortality, particularly if it's implemented early in an outbreak. Uh, the potential for, there's a potential for much greater impact if the vaccination approach is preemptive, uh, particularly if the vaccine can be shown to be safe and effective in pregnant women and in children and older age groups. Uh, the results were robust to extensive sensitivity analysis with different model assumptions. Um, but it's unclear to what extent these results were generalized to an urban setting, such as the Chad outbreak, which in the previous talk, and endemic settings. And this is an important area for future research. And I'd like to acknowledge the Uganda Ministry of Health and WHO and the MSF Uganda team at that time that helped to generate the results and respond to the outbreak. But I'd particularly like to mention Jeff Mercer, who um, supported us with some of the earlier hepatitis E work. He died suddenly in 2014 and will be remembered sadly. Thank you.